Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Blong, uh, and I'm the founder and president of Charting Transcendence Incorporated. Um, it's a company that I started earlier this year. Um, and after uh, a long time of considering uh, what I wanted to do um, with my life, um, broadly, as well as professionally, uh, in trying to share uh, my gifts um, and passions um, with the broader and wider world. And so um, I'm a person who's done a lot of different things um, in his life. I've been very fortunate to have traveled um, around the world many times. I've been to roughly 100 countries in the world um, and have had the chance to explore it as um, a U.S. diplomat, um, which I did throughout my 20s, and as um, a person working in global business um, for the better part of 10 years um, throughout my 30s. Um, but several years ago, I also um, I decided that um, my passion for the visual arts had become quite strong, and I went uh, to do a degree at Sotheby's, uh, Sotheby's Institute of Art in New York City and completed that in 2019. Um, but it took me a little while um, to decide um, exactly what I wanted to do in the broader art world. So um, this year, um, I founded Charting Transcendence Incorporated, which is a bespoke art advisory and consulting a firm that works with um, collectors and art enthusiasts to help educate them on art, especially contemporary art and the world of contemporary art, and help them uh, collect art that they will love and cherish uh, for many years to come. So without ado, I'd like to start the presentation um, and let you know about how I came, came up with this. Excuse me. Um, so as I said, um, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to see an exhibition, um, at, um, the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, and I had heard about this exhibition, uh, and I'd heard about, um, this painter, um, who, as you can see, um, he, unfortunately, he did not have a very long life or a very long um, career. However, he was quite prolific in the time that he was working in painting. Um, this presentation that I'm giving today, I'd like to just um, foreground it by saying that um, I'm going to show you a number of the images that were in uh, this exhibition uh, that was in Dallas. And that's now um, actually at the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, it's called The Realm of Appearances. Um, and it was expertly curated by a curator named Vivian Lee, who I had the, had the opportunity to meet when I was in Dallas. And the topic, uh, the kind of subtitle of this um, presentation is a self-reflexive journey to finding oneself in contemporary art. And so as much as this is um, a presentation where I would like to tell you about these incredible paintings and this artist's journey uh, through himself, um, this is as much a story about um, me finding my own self in, uh, in Matthew Wong's work. Um, and it's not lost on me that, you know, the guy has a similar name uh, to me. Um, and I think I had first heard of him um, three or four years ago when I read an article about him, his work in the New York Times and read several articles and several art critics had um, heaped of effusive praise on his work. And then last year when I was at Art Basel in Miami Beach, I saw one work um, of his for sale and I was quite um, impressed by it. But otherwise I had not seen any of his work uh, up close and personal and I was not really familiar with his entire story um, until one day I, I uh, in February, I, I went to see this exhibition at the Dallas Museum of Art. And I will walk you through um, the feelings that I felt that day and seeing um, his work. But first of all, I'd like to point out um, some of the things that I think made this exhibition uh, exceptional and, uh, and, and Matthew Wong's work exceptional. First of all, um, he's an artist who I could clearly see within the first five, 10 minutes of looking at his work. He made many, many atypical choices uh, for an artist. 
um, in how he approached his work. Um, I saw him having executed works in various different styles. He didn't have just one style that he worked in. And again, some artists uh, have one clear distinct style that you can see in their work. It's consistent throughout their work. And some artists employ different styles uh, throughout their work. Um, and you may be able to categorize them by themes or by their approaches or by the media. Um, Matthew Wong's work was all over the place, um, but still it was coherent as a whole. Um, he, um, he, he took in a lot of diverse influences um, from everything from uh, film to um, classical art references to modern and uh, impressionistic and modern art references to contemporary ones. Um, I saw his in his work an extremely high level of technical mastery of the brush. And um, I don't have uh, personally a background in painting and I haven't really ever picked up a brush in my life. So I don't think I'm qualified to explain all of the technical details about his brush work and um, what he actually did putting um, ink onto paper or oil into canvas, but I'll do my best um, throughout this um, presentation to explain. Um, the psychological depth of his work, um, just pay attention to that. Um, it's not hard to pick up on, um, but that it, I found extremely moving. Um, his work was full of artistic references, as I mentioned, from coming from those diverse influences, both from low, that is popular culture, as well as high culture, um, the kind of art you see in, in, in museums and in taught in um, art history classes. Um, then there was also within Matthew Wong's story, the story of someone who was on the outside of the art world. And I'll explain a little bit more about where he came from and how he did that, uh, who was struggling to become an insider. And the art world is one of these places that it does divide itself into outsiders and insiders. And I could see him progressing through a journey from the outside to the inside. Um, lastly, the two points I'll make about him that I think are relevant um, to not only the work that he did, but the, the work that I've done myself, um, there is a self-reflexive nature of what he was doing. Though that is the, 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 the work that he produced was about the fact that he was doing it himself. And I'll explain a little bit more about that when I give you some examples. And then lastly, I, I think, um, and I can identify this personally, and I will let you in a little bit more on this as we go along. Uh, he had a really unique way of seeing the world. And I could identify this um, with this. And, and this is what um, this is one of the things that touched me so deeply about his work. So uh, as I said, this exhibition was put on in Dallas. Uh, it was the first U.S. comprehensive museum uh, show of Matthew Wong's work. I think that there had been one a year or two ago in Canada, um, uh, in the Art Gallery of Ontario, I believe. Um, Matthew Wong was Canadian, uh, but um, as you might guess, he was of, um, of Chinese origin. His parents um, were from Hong Kong. And although he was born in Canada, he was raised in between Canada and Hong Kong. So I think he spent time in Hong Kong as a child and then came back to Canada uh, and then went over back over to Hong Kong uh, in his 20s. And he pursued uh, a master's of fine arts in Hong Kong at the university there, but not in painting, uh, he, actually in photography. So actually, I, this is something I have in common with him because I'm a, uh, a photographer by training myself. Uh, but I passed up on a career in that uh, after September 11th when I decided uh, I wanted to go overseas and fight bad guys um, um, in the diplomatic service. Um, however, the fact that I have an eye for photography and I'm trained in that is something I can identify when I look at Matthew's work. But um, he literally never picked up a brush, as far as I can tell, until... Um, about 2012 or even 2013. Uh, and that was when he graduated from 
uh, his MFA program, he had decided that photography wasn't um, the medium through which he could fully express himself. So he started to teach himself how to paint. And he did this by looking at books and going on YouTube and connecting with various artists um, over Instagram. So very contemporary way of, of going about it, actually. Um, and uh, again, what I want to say is, is, although the museum uh, of uh, the Dallas Museum of Art um, had this exhibition in February, it, it opened in Boston last month, and it will be running uh, there until uh, February of 2024. So I, I highly urge you to go and see it, his work, uh, if you're in Boston over the next six months. Um, again, what I'm about to show you are uh, reproductions of his work. They're actually photographs I took of it in the gallery, and I I'm pretty experienced in taking decent photos of work, but um, when it comes to looking at these paintings, you really have to look at paintings of Matthew Wong up close and in person. I wouldn't say that's the case about all um, um, art uh, and all paintings. Certainly when it comes to contemporary paintings, often looking at a reproduction, reproduction is nearly as good as looking at the real thing. Um, you can get a sense for it, but Matthew Wong's work is more like that of an old master, um, which is something interesting about him. Again, it, it's the blend of the old and the new um, that he was that, that he excelled in. And so you really have to look up close. And in fact, I found the more I looked, the more I wanted to look more and more deeply. Um, and that is just something that doesn't happen to me uh, that often. And again, I'll stress that I'm the kind of guy I go to hundreds of um hundreds and hundreds of museum and gallery exhibitions every year. And I have been doing this for years and I see plenty of paintings. It is the most common medium, um, artistic medium that's out there, the most kind of durable and, uh, and, and, um, um, and, and appealing to the broader public. And I see so many paintings. Um, and when I get emotional about artwork, it's rarely about paintings, it's more frequently when I'm in a full room installation or something with music or um, sp spatially, um, you know, sculpture installation or, or when it's a certain gallery museum that has that has some sort of a deeper uh, meaning or uh, some sort of more elaborate kind of setup. Um, the Dallas Museum of Art is, is, a, is a lovely museum, but the gallery that they had put Matthew's work in was not... Um, remarkable in any way. It was a simple white walled gallery. So as I'm driving down the highway um, in Dallas on that morning in February, I had somewhat of a premonition that I was in for something special, but I can never really know. Um, because again, many times and very frequently, I'll hear about an art or artist and I say, wow, I really want to see that. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's okay. And sometimes it's not that impressive. But on this day, I felt a little emotional before going in to see his work. I think it could have been the fact that he had this tragic story of, um, and I was aware that he had died by his own hand at the age of 35, uh, someone um, who had struggled with mental health issues uh, throughout his life. And that's basically all that I knew. Um, and so I go into the exhibition and I learned that when he started painting, because he was in a Hong Kong, the easiest way for him to do it was uh, to learn uh, a style of painting called Chinese ink painting, which has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And it's still a very productive medium, uh, not only in China, all over East Asia. Today, um, you have paper and you have ink. And though the application of one onto the other, you create artwork. And so he was learning how to do this himself. And so the first part of the exhibition was dedicated to his early essays in ink painting. And when I looked at these ink paintings, I thought this is interesting, uh, you know, an atypical way to start, you know, learning how to paint. But sure, he's of Chinese origin. He's in China. So why not, you know, give it a try that way? And you can see here what he was trying to do is paint some sort of grid format and you see the awkwardness of the splotches because it's almost proof of the fact that, you know, anyone who's ever tried ink painting is going to come across the, 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 this discovery that the ink doesn't always do what you want it to do. <laughs> so it kind of ended up like this. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty good and interesting. Okay. And then I go on and see more of his ink paintings. Um, these are untitled works. 
from early in his career. And I think to myself, you know, this is pretty interesting. The brush strokes, you know, there are different kinds of brush strokes. There are different kinds of things I'm looking at here. I'm looking at, you know, the, this, 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 it's, I'm, I'm, I'm looking more deeply uh, and at, at this work and I'm thinking to myself, not bad. This is interesting. It's okay. There are some ambiguities. There are some places I wonder. And I also start to notice the interesting concept that is very free common in, in um, East Asian art, but not necessarily as common in Western art is the concept of negative space. That is the space that's created um, uh, on the uh, paper or canvas uh, where you do not apply the ink or the paint. And uh, as I look further, I can see um, more examples of this. And again, I start to see some themes emerge. I see this kind of path through kind of this wilderness or cave. Um, again, it has psychological depth on the right hand side. I can see here, for example, what looks like a forest, what looks like it could be figures, trees, uh, some ambiguities and interesting things. And then I get to more of these works and I start to again appreciate the, the brush strokes, the use of the negative space is especially pronounced here on the right hand side. Uh, it's a work called Where Did the Time Go? And again, I'm, you know, I'm impressed, but, you know, not necessarily floored. But then I proceed into the next gallery and I start to look at some of his works in color. And just these two paintings are about, are large canvases, they're about eight and a half feet high. And the brush strokes are really thick with paint. In fact, they're so thick with paint, it's almost like caked up in some places. And I get the feeling that this is awkward. This is maybe not like a perfect, these are not perfect artworks. These are attempts that he's making after a couple of years with the, the, with the brush and, and, and the ink and paper. He's moved over to the Western um, style medium of oil on canvas. And um, I can certainly appreciate the brush strokes that he's made, especially on the right hand side. This, this painting is called Gone Till November, um, which is probably a reference to the Wyclef Jean song from the 1990s. Um, and you know, I can appreciate the Eastern kind of influence of the brush strokes, the, the, the cherry blossoms, perhaps. I also see, again, these strange ambiguities. What is this figure in the foreground, um, you know, in the lower left hand corner here? Um, again, these trees, what well, the color, the use of color is really interesting. It's in experimentative, but there's something intuitive about it. And as I go on, um, I really uh, started to get very, very, very impressed when I looked at this large uh, canvas, uh, which is called River at Dusk from 2015, um, 78 inches wide. And um, I'm reading the wall labels for each of these works. I'm taking in the information and I realize um, what he's done in this work here, how he's achieved this, this, um, this kind of mystical landscape is actually by applying multiple layers of paint. Um, you can see there's yellow, there's green and blue and maybe even some black in there. And uh, what he's done actually is waited not until the first layer is dry before he applies the next layer and then applies another layer over that and then basically turns the brush around and uh, with the back end of the brush he carves these what looks to be like reeds or leaves or kind of a thicket of of vines and perhaps we're standing on the bank you can kind of see some big leaves down here and I look at it and I just say, this is incredible that someone who only had picked up a brush two or three years pr prior is not only applying paint in an expert manner, but is removing the paint. And I think any, any painter will tell you that it's at least five times harder to remove paint than it is to apply paint. Uh, because of course, if you apply it and you make a mistake, you can you can always apply some more or mix in or whatever, but once you remove it, it's gone. And 
you know, you're not able to like, you're not able to necessarily put it back on like the way that it was before. But this started to make me realize I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at the hand of a master. And honestly, by this point, like I, then I go and I see more of his works in color and I realize that the style is very different from some of the other works. Here we see a much flatter style than the earlier ones where the style was very thick. Again, some artists may choose a thick style. They may choose a flat style of painting or they may choose both, but that's an atypical choice. And so I start kind of like running through my head and thinking of all this, these atypical choices that Matthew Wong has made. Uh, at the same time, I'm just becoming very emotional inside and I start to get a little teary eyed. But then I, I keep going on and I realize I think I'm feeling something really powerful here. And I start, I basically, I basically start sobbing there in the gallery and i was like why is this happening i mean i get emotional sometimes like i said every now and then every once in a blue moon usually like when i'm feeling or seeing something or there's more of a spatial thing or more maybe some other sensory thing going on here it's just me in silence there's not even many people in the gallery fortunately because if they had looked over at me, they're going to be seeing a grown man crying. And I'm like, I look at paintings all the time. What is it about these paintings? There is definitely a sadness. There's definitely this emotional depth to the work and this kind of like psychological element. Uh, and, and certainly I realize it's very sad. He died. He died of suicide um, after having created these amazing artworks. But... I didn't know the guy personally. Um, I didn't know anyone who knew him. Um, why is why is this having such a deep like emotional effect on me? I'm not even sure. But just to tell you about these two paintings uh, before I go on, um, both of these paintings were bought during Matthew's lifetime. They're actually quite small. They're only about a foot high. And they were both bought by artists um, actually famous artists, contemporary artists who Matthew, whom Matthew had befriended over Instagram. And I think had come to one of his earlier gallery shows in New York city at Karma gallery. And, uh, one is called contemplating the iceberg here on the left. So you see this kind of human figure and standing in front of this thing that looks like an iceberg. I interesting choices of color. Certainly you could reflect on the emotional effect of that, um, a kind of, um, green color and the blue and the white. And on the right hand side, we have a view that doesn't de depict any de particular place, I would say, but I'm just curious if anyone might guess where this might, what place on earth this might represent. And you can unmute yourself right now if you know the answer. If you're not Bobby, that is, because I told him yesterday. Um, it's, so it's actually meant to depict Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles. Um, I don't know that Matthew Wong ever visited there, but certainly Mulholland Drive is a place that we're all kind of, we've all seen in films and Matthew was an enormous film buff. And, um, I actually just really love the simplicity of it. Um, again, you know, the heterogeneous styles, I'll point out that sometimes his paintings are very complex and sometimes they're very simple. And the simplicity sometimes comes from the limited choice of color pa palette and, um, and just the, the kind of like, you can almost see like he's attacked this kind of work in, in some small sections, but really just maybe four or five sections. Um, and he could have completed it, you know, within an hour or so, because it's only about, you know, one foot high. Um, another interesting thing about Matthew Wong is he tended to um, uh, almost always complete his paintings in one sitting. 
um, which is impressive when you look at the bigger ones, especially, and they, some of them are, are, are eight or 10 feet wide, almost, uh, not quite 10 feet, um, up to about eight, eight and a half feet, actually. And so at this point, I'm in the gallery and I'm just basically sobbing in front of every single painting um, that I see. Um, the one on the left uh, is, is titled Children of a Primordial Land. And again, you can see two human figures down here. You can see them sitting in a meadow, perhaps by some water. Um, but what is this behind them? I don't know. Is it a mountain? Is it a cave? Uh, you can see a kind of a waterfall and sky up here, but it's really ambiguous. And it's more of a psychological weight than it is an actual landscape. But I have to point out, again, what I see here and what the curator made very clear is that Matthew's work was heavily inspired by the Chinese ink painting that he had seen uh, in China. Um, many of them he saw only in books at the Hong Kong uh, Central Library. But I can definitely uh, see some elements here that refer back to Chinese ink painting. So he again blended old and new and east and west. He did this throughout his work. And I cannot think of any, any other artist who's done this as masterfully as he has. On the right-hand side, this is actually um, a watercolor and it's called Origin. And again, you can see here this, again, one of the themes that emerges are these portals, these holes you can look through. Again, a kind of negative space where the ink, uh, well, in this case, a watercolor, but it looks more like the Chinese ink that we're used to seeing. And then there's a little bit of this white negative space here. And again, that's way more typical in Eastern, uh, 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 you know, uh, painting and, than it is in the West, although not unheard of. But again, I was just trying to list these things in my mind, the atypical choices that he was making, and I just couldn't keep track of them after a while. Everything was so, everything was so unique that he was doing these, the, 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 the melding of all these different styles and forms. And then, oh my God, I mean, to see these paintings up close, um, it was, it was so much, there was so much joy, but then also so much, just so much emotion. And again, while I was looking at it in real time, I could hardly figure it out, but I was just looking so deeply at it. And so on the left-hand side, I don't even think I realized what this was depicting at first, um, a friend later, I later shared this with a friend um, who's from Canada, actually, and she said, oh, it's clearly fireflies. She said, because in Canada, we have fireflies um, in the summer, um, like in a lot of places in North America. But it didn't occur to me at first that this could be um, fireflies. It looked more like leaves falling or something like that. But it, it, it's, it's, it's up to your inter interpretation. The title of this painting on the left is Distance. And you see a male figure, a female figure, and this kind of little body of water that separates them. And then just, I, I, can't, um, I can't stress um, how beautiful it is just seeing the very limited color palette that he has here. You really just have black, uh, yellow, um, a little bit of white, and white mixed in with the yellow and then this blue. Um, and again, I'm not an expert in color theory, um, but to me, it seems masterful. Um, and on the right-hand side, this painting is one of my favorites and I think it will be, become one of the most iconic Matthew Wong images um, uh, that will last um, throughout the ages. Um, this painting is called Landscape with Mother and Child. And here, most clearly, you can see the influence um, because Matthew Wong um, took in influences from artists throughout history. Uh, a number of contemporary artists uh, that I could point out, and some of you may know Alex Katz or Lois Dodd, or even there's um, a little bit of uh, Hockney, but this most clearly is, um, is based off the, the style of, of Vincent van Gogh. Uh, whom um, the articles and um, critics um, have frequently compared Matthew Wong to for the obvious reasons that they both um, had short 
but very prolific and brilliant careers. They were both art world outsiders struggling to become insiders. They both throughout their lives remained on the outside and only sold a handful of works. I think Van Gogh only sold two. Matthew Wong sold more than that, but he is not he had not become a household name in the art world by any means by the time of his death and i think van gogh was 37 um when he died by his own hand and matthew wong was 35 but this work uh, actually is going to go with a number of other similar works by matthew wong and again just how different is this style from the style of some of the other paintings we saw before yet there's consistency uh between it um that's really hard to describe, um, but this just shows how brilliant he was. And this painting, along with a couple of others in the style, is going to be shown at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam next year, I'm told, um, which I think is an incredibly high honor um, for um, an artist um, like Matthew Wong. And this painting also, I will say, and the exhibition made light of this fact, is and this is almost never done with contemporary art, but because almost there's almost never a reason for it. Um, but um, the, this painting was given to conservators to actually x ray and see that Matthew Wong had actually painted another painting on this canvas before he completely repainted it and changed the scene, uh, changed the scenery of it. And they found a photograph that he had taken of this canvas before and matched it up with what they could see on the x-ray. So um, Matthew Wong was a kind of painter. Again, contemporary artists generally don't do this. They don't need to. In the 19th century or earlier, canvas was expensive. And so often canvases were repainted. Um, and then conservatives, hundreds of years later, they x-ray and they find there's another subject in between. Or they paint on both sides of the canvas. I don't know any contemporary artists who do that. Um, mainly because the canvas is not that expensive these days, um, relatively speaking, but it, it's, it's just an incredible little note to say that Matthew Wong had this vision um, and he was flexible with it and the execution was so, so brilliant. You can just see in all those colors and the brush strokes that are so, so different. And then on this next slide, I'll show you two works that I found interesting. On the left, we have a gouache. A gouache is a kind of um, a watercolor with a thicker binding agent to make the, the paint, the, the watercolor a little more opaque. And it's called Once Upon a Time in the West, which is a reference to a spaghetti Western movie by Sergio Leone. These are like 1960s Italian kind of like, um, you know, bad imitations of American Western movies but that's kind of a cult genre. And Matthew Wong was a film buff who watched at least one full length movie every evening, uh, I'm told. Um, and it's quite beautiful. And again, you can see the different kind of brushstrokes and a mixture of flat and more kind of choppy style of brushstrokes. And on the right-hand side, this one I didn't get, um, even though I looked at it a couple of times first, it's called Youth 2016. I don't think I completely got it until the curator pointed out to me lately. I uh, curator pointed out to me um, towards my the end of my stay in Dallas. Um, some of the detail in here, you can see this male figure and then this female figure and then this landscape with flowers and these mountains in the background. And what I can't tell if this is rain or if this is thunder and lightning or if this is some sort of cherry blossom hanging down. Again, the ambiguity is beautiful, but looking at it, I actually reflected quite deeply on the psychological um, weight of my own youth as a, a male. Um, Matthew Wong is a heterosexual male, um, as am I. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't really notice until I was up close that this little brushstroke right here makes all the difference. Uh, and I was really like, oh, wow. Uh, so, it ended up that this painting was purchased at one of Matthew's early shows by a, a, a famous contemporary art, artist by the name of Rashid Johnson. He was very proud to buy it because he said, yeah, this is my masturbation, you know, painting by Matthew Wong. And I was like, whoa, okay. I didn't even catch it at first, but the emotional kind of resonance of youth and what that meant to me, that carried through. Um, when I saw it, even if I'd missed this little detail, but 
I think you could look at these paintings for a long, long, long time and come up with all sorts of details that you may have missed on the first glance. So this canvas, for example, this is the realm of appearances. And this is where the title of the show came from. And again, this is a kind of painting you have to look at really, really deeply. Um, and when you do, you start to understand that Matthew Wong saw the world in his own very unique and different way, I believe. Um, I can feel it here. Um, there's a simplicity to how he's divided the canvas between the horizon and the sky. And really up here, we see these kind of very muted colors, this very, this, these kind of mountains, the gray kind of night sky, the moon, these thick brush strokes, and then little dots of white paint for stars. And then below what we have in terms of the colors being kind of so almost unnatural for a landscape, almost like an invitation into a psychological portal and trees and um, leaves and these other figures that it's just like, I'm not sure if these are trees or if they are, they're the craziest looking trees I've ever seen. So you know that this is, a, this is as much a psychological landscape as it is a, a real one. And then, uh, and you see this in several of his paintings, uh, this theme here of there's a person kind of looks like he's wearing a hoodie, um, staring, looks like he's staring down into a black well. A premonition of Matthew Wong's fate or perhaps a rich reference to any one of a number of topics or places where you can find wells. I'm not exactly sure, but again, there's no substitute for looking at this painting, which is um, 65 by 80 inches. Um, there's no substitute for looking at it up close. Um, I'm just trying to give you the best sense of the feeling that I got when I was looking at this, um, which it was overwhelming. This particular painting, I'm sorry, uh, this particular painting, I have to explain just briefly why this exhibition was in Dallas. Um, Dallas, of course, is kind of, um, for me, it, for me, it was only my third time visiting Dallas. I came this time to visit a friend, um, and I've had fun in Dallas before, but I don't really know it that well. And it doesn't have much of, um, an emotional meaning for me. I mean, perhaps more broadly in the American psyche, it does, but, um, otherwise for me, it's just a big kind of city in the center of the United States. Um, Matthew's only connection to Dallas was, however, an important one because um, just about the time Matthew Wong was starting to get um, some attention from gallerists in the art world, his gallerist um, decided to participate in this art fair that happens in Dallas every April called the Dallas Art Show and the, the Dallas Art Fair. And um, a couple of Matthew's paintings were taken out to Dallas and the um, the gallerist was going to set up the booth the next day in the morning and so that the VIPs could come in the afternoon uh, and get kind of first dibs on, 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 on the artworks. It's typically how it works. Um, the night before, um, Matthew asked this gallerist, hey, you know that painting I painted, you know, this one. Yeah. Um, you think I could just borrow it, have it back? You know, I'm going to take it back to my hotel room. I'm gonna, I just got to fix something. The gallerist is like, okay, and lets him do that. And then the gallerist is setting up the booth in the morning. Matthew comes back with the painting. He's almost half of it's repainted, almost completely. He's added all these stars to the sky and he's changed the colors and changed the kind of layout. He's, he's almost like entirely repainted it. I mean, it was, it was about half of it, but it's like, okay, you didn't like it. And the painting is still wet. That day, in the afternoon, the folks from the Dallas Museum of Art, by prior arrangement with the art fair, come through the art fair, and they look at this painting, and they're like, wow, we want this one. Like, we're going to snatch this up. And they buy it on the spot. And they take it back to the museum that evening, and the registrar, who kind of, like, checks it in, you know, to their inventory and so on, notes the paint is still wet on this painting. And it's called the West. And 
that was the only museum acquisition of Matthew's works made during his lifetime. Um, so an interesting story. Um, that's his connection to Dallas and why Dallas got the honor of hosting the first um, museum uh, retrospective of Matthew's works. Uh, this painting is one of my absolute favorites, and I'm going to try to give you a couple of up close um, snippets of it so you can see some of the detail. But you can see it's called the kingdom. And here in the middle, you can see this figure. I think you can see it well enough on the screen. Looks like a human figure with a crown, three points on his crown. The crown could be a reference to Jean-Michel Jean Basquiat, but more likely it is a reference directly to Wong himself as Wong in uh, Cantonese means king. And Matthew Wong signed all of his paintings on the back of the canvas with the Chinese character for Wong, which is the same as for king. And you can just see this king standing in a birch, it's called the kingdom. And he's standing in this forest of birches. This is absolutely gorgeous. And the colors, again, like it's not, difficult to make the connection to the Impressionists, the, the Pointillists of the 19th century. Um, but this broad kind of panorama is more a style you would see in an old master work, um, I would say. And so he's blending all these different elements and I'm just like, wow. But then again, there are these weird ambiguities like this figure here looks kind of like a fig, but it's large and I stared at it for the longest time. I couldn't figure out what it was. Again, the king seems to be standing on some sort of like, um, some sort of like gray. I can't tell if that's a pedestal or whatever, but he appears to be the only human figure in the, in the in on the canvas, in the frame. I'll give you some close-ups here, just so you can see these brushstrokes. These are unreal. Okay. And especially some of these brushstrokes that go across the side and seem to have painted over, that gives the painting kind of a texture. I mean, this is, this is incredible work. This is masterful. And again, just comparing it to, and again, like I could get very technical about the exact brushstrokes in the, in the approach and so on. And how he, I have no idea how he did this, especially an enormous canvas like this. This is again, like, at least I think seven feet wide or so. And um, he's just, he's just created, you know, this absolutely, um, this absolutely stunning scenery, which with again, and it just begs you to look so deeply. So I'm doing this as much as I can in the gallery, my first go through it. And I'm, but I'm just sobbing profusely. And again, I don't know why that is. I mean, I feel the, I feel the psychological depth. I feel the sadness of the blue color. Blue was one of his most commonly used colors, but as you can already see, he didn't discriminate. He used many, many different colors in his color works. He continued painting with in black and white uh, with Chinese ink painting throughout his career, but the closer he got to the end of his career, 2018 and 2019, is where you can really see, I think, some work that's, I mean, some of this to me is almost flawless. Whereas earlier works, I could say, well, there are a lot of flaws there, but it was all part of the process of him learning how to paint and about how he was trying to find himself and situate himself in the world and in a broader art historical context. Um, really stunning stuff. Um, but again, just like the little brush strokes here that make tracks in the forest and how they just kind of go off into the distance here, it's incredible. And over here, this is called River at Night. Again, you get the sense of what it is to look through and how he attacked different parts of the canvas at different times with different brushstrokes. The heterogeneity of all of that. It's kind of like an obsession. It's there's there's a bit of uh, Yayoi Kusama in it too. This is not lost on 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 people, certainly not on myself. But then the flatness here 
is more typical of other artist styles. And it's a blend all over. And then just look at how many colors go into this palette. It's actually quite a few here. It's probably at least six or eight. I can't quite tell. But again, it just begs for you to look at it so deeply. Um, another one here on the left-hand side is called Old Town. It's a rather large canvas that I looked at for a very long time. And I was so delighted because in these windows here, I could see little human figures. I think I counted 10 or 11 of them. But then you see in the foreground, there's this meadow, there's this path, there's a wall. Again, the perspective all kind of jumbled up. That's an art historical reference to several artists who do that. I mean, it was, you know, Picasso and the Cubists who first really shifted a perspective on things. Um, Eastern artists had done that, you know, generations before with a kind of a flatter, I mean, all of these things that you can learn about in art history classes. And Matthew Wong was all over that. And he was just intuitively making, you know, like, just pouring out his heart and soul and psyche onto the canvas in so many different ways. On the right-hand side, what is that one called? Path to the Sea. And here, you can almost you know, miss this human figure here. You see this head um, and shoulders of a person looking at a path and looking towards that. Again, we've seen this, um, we've seen this kind of portal this kind of like end of light at the end of a tunnel or a cave. Again, for someone who um, I learned had been struggling with depression throughout his life. Um, not only depression, but Tourette syndrome, um, which I don't know that much about. Um, there is, there is definitely a psychological depth in there that's un unescapable. And then two of these, these two canvases, um, one of these on the left-hand side is going to, is going to be in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It's already been donated. On the right-hand side, that's the left-hand side, it's called Unknown, Unknown Pleasures. On the right-hand side, it's called Blue Rain. And that is a gift of a famous contemporary artist um, who, who purchased it. And it's a promised gift to MoMA in New York. Um, so these canvases will will eventually be on view to see in New York City. Uh, and they are just so masterful and so beautiful. Again, on the left-hand side, if you just look at the different parts of the canvas, the, you can see how, the, you can see the different elements and how they kind of come together. And on the right-hand side, of course, the, the rain, the brushstrokes of the rain, it's um, probably a reference to Katsushika Hokusai. Um, the Japanese woodblock master who did the Blue Wave and Red Fuji and a number of other prints where he captured the visual effect of rain. And Vincent van Gogh riffed off of that, by the way, and some of the other um, ones who followed the, some other impression, impressionists like Edouard Vuillard. And so this is just so rich in, in art historical references. Um, I then have to say after completing the exhibition, I was so overcome with emotion that, and I'd been crying for like 40 minutes straight. Um, and I was just like, okay. Um, it was about noon or 1230. And I planned to spend a couple more hours at the art museum. And I was just like, I'm done. I just like, I can't do this. I was like, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't, I'm, I'm crying profusely. I can't stop. I don't know what to do. As I go outside into a park and I just, I need to eat something. I get a burrito or something from a food truck and I'm sitting there crying and eating my, eating my burrito or whatever it was. And I needed about 45 minutes or an hour, close to an hour to gain my composure, to be able to go back inside the museum. Cause I figured it would be a real shame if I just, you know, called it quits on my art viewing day. I mean, I can go to a museum and go to multiple museums in a day when I'm traveling and look at art for five, six, seven hours, no problem. Um, this day I was just grappling with why, why did this hit me so hard? Why on this day, what, what is this about? 
And I was able to regain my composure and go back and look at the other exhibitions in the museum, which were excellent. And I had an excellent time looking at them and it was excellent artwork. And it was just like a, 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 a rated day. Um, you know, even without the mat looking at the Matthew Wong, which, but I was like, uh, I don't know if I go back in that exhibition again, I'm going to start crying again. But after a couple of hours looking at the other exhibitions, I said, you know, I'm here. I, I really, really want to go look at this paintings again. So I go back into the exhibition and I don't again, normally do this. Like I don't usually run through an exhibition twice in, on, on, in a single day, but I went back and I had the fortune. It was a synchronicity at that moment. The curator of the exhibition was starting to give a tour. And so I, and again, usually I don't go to curator led tours because I find that I can absorb the feeling and the information of the exhibition faster on my own. Um, but I, but I really wanted to learn more about Matthew Wong. And so she took me and several other people through the exhibition again. And this is a photograph of her presenting the final painting in the exhibition as you kind of walk through it logically. And it's called see you on the other side. It's, one of the very last paintings that he he painted before his death and i giving you a close-up here so that you can see a little bit of the detail you can see the eastern elements of the kind of cherry blossoms and the crane and you see this lone solitary figure looking across again negative space the void between him and this landscape in the far distance you can see up here the stars in the sky and this little crescent moon again masterful brush strokes um, all over the place and then zoom in closer. And I was just like, wow, there's a little figure in the door there. It's one little brushstroke. Amazing. And then I'd say, you know, the next day I went back to the exhibition I went, I was out kind of out of my way, but I was in Dallas one more day and I changed my schedule so I could go back and look at the exhibition a third time. And that day I was more composed and I didn't cry. I didn't, um, I was able to hold my composure and I just took so much joy in looking very deeply at these paintings and integrating all of the thoughts and feelings I was having. And, um, what I realized, I guess I'll tell you guys this now before I show you this one last painting and, and I'll summarize everything up. What I realized was something um, that's, that, that's very germane to the practice of contemporary art, which is that, remember how I said at the beginning about that there's a self-reflexive nature of doing and that uh, what I was identifying with, what was hitting me so hard emotionally was not the fact that simply I saw myself in these paintings because I didn't see myself. I mean, you could be look at a, something and be like a work of art and see, wow, that reminds me of something in myself and I see myself in that or something. I, I couldn't say that. What I could say was that uh, I understood where Matthew was coming from and why he was doing what he was doing. As I said, he was, he was learning how to paint and through the post process of learning how to paint, of course, he made some mistakes. He did some awkward things. He did some beautiful things. He was doing that in order to find himself and in order to situate himself in the world in a broader art historical context. And here I was, it was like a subversive, like, meta thing experience that I had. I had been looking at artwork, at paintings for years, for years, traveling around the world to do it and cultivating a practice of doing it in order so that I could find myself and situate myself in the broader world and in a broader artistic context. And so here I was confronted with not a doppelganger, but almost like a, kin a kindred spirit. Matthew Wong, Matthew Blong, that's what hit me so hard. And 
there's one more thing I'll say about Matthew Wong. And I learned this at some point I absorbed this. I can't remember if it was from a wall text or if it was from the curator walking me through on the second time I went through the exhibition. Um, Matthew Wong did suffer from depression and, and bipolar disorder. I can't relate to that in my life and my experience. I've never experienced that. I know people who have, but I can't relate to that personally. Um, Tourette syndrome, also something I, I can't relate to. But a few years before he died, Matthew Wong was formally diagnosed as being on what is called the autism spectrum. And um, I have to say that by the time I came to this exhibition, I had um, come to the realization very slowly over several years leading up to that, the understanding that I am also, I also identify as being on this spectrum. And some of the things that I felt like I had in common with an artist like Matthew Wong, um, especially this unique way of seeing the world and the atypical choices that Matthew made in his artistic practice are like, are not unsimilar to those, the kinds of atypical choices that I made in my life. And for those of you who know me and know the journey that I've been on throughout my life, I've made a lot of atypical, unusual choices. And I've reveled in those. And it's conf been confusing sometimes. It's been hard sometimes. And it's meant that I really had to go and look for myself and try to find myself. And this experience that I had in Dallas with the paintings of Matthew Wong um, brought me for full circle and home to myself. So as his last painting, I'd like to show you, um, I'm showing you the, the on, it's the full canvas here on the surface, a square canvas, I think four feet by four feet, five, five by five. And um, again, very limited palette color. And again, I'm sorry, the, the photographs don't accurately capture the actual orange color that you have here because there's light in the gallery and this is a photograph of a painting and it doesn't, you have to see it up close. But it's basically just black and orange, it almost has this kind of Halloween-y type feeling to it. And some of the elements that you see in other paintings and these figures here, there are several human figures there are several animal figures too that you can see. And there's a guy looking into a well or standing by a well. And I'm not exactly sure what all this stuff is. Here you can see where he's kind of scratched into the paint. It's like all the different techniques that he's used and he's unleashed on the canvas. And then I just want to show you up close here. Um, oh, there's a crane on the left-hand side here, like we've seen in some of the other paintings. And, the, and over here on the right-hand side, this little excerpt, you have this figure. You have this kind of amorphous looking, I'm not sure what that is, can't really tell. And then these kind of like hash, hash marks over here, couldn't really tell what that was. But the curator pointed out to me, said, you know, Matthew Wong was very smart. Of course, he read a lot about art. He looked at a lot of art in books and in museums. And so he was very well familiar with the art historical canvas. And she said, you look at right there, can you see it? And I was like, what? She said, unicorn. Can you see it? It's a unicorn. I was like, what? He's like, you know, like that unicorn. You guys seen this uh, unicorn before? It's, um, it's a tapestry from the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance, I don't know, it's from probably from the 15, 1600s. It's at the Cloisters Museum on the Upper West Side of New York. Um, anyway, it's, it become a very popular image because it's been reproduced on um, handbags and, and souvenirs and things like that. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. There it is. There's the pen. And I don't know if that's a unicorn's horn or maybe this thing on the side, like outside is the unicorn. I don't know. There are so many stories about unicorns and their pens and why this artwork was created and so on. I can't, I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to get into all of that. But my thesis, the thesis of my presentation is that Matthew Wong was a unicorn among artists, and he knew it, and he was unbelievably smart and clever and uh, is an artist 
that I think will be considered the one of the, the very greatest of his generation of the last decade and probably of this century as well. Um, so that being said, I just need to say one other thing before I open up for comments, which is um, I, after seeing this exhibition, it didn't take me long to put together um, a couple of pieces that I, I had not known what to do with for several years. And I decided I'm going to found this company and I'm going to call it Charting Transcendence because Charting Transcendence is what I do. It is my super my superpower. And I am not an art world insider, um, strictly speaking. Um, I'm more of an outsider who's learned how to be an insider, just like Matthew Wong did. Um, and I am passionate about sharing my um, love of art and how, especially how I've gone about learning about art with other people. And I think that uh, I have the skills and the, um, the competence and the passion to really help people learn and find art that they wouldn't normally know it even existed to help them um, to help them chart their own way through the stories and meaning making around art that's important and tracing a map um, of art and art history um, throughout um, throughout time I mean again I specialize in contemporary art which is the bulk of the market today but um, I don't discriminate in terms of time uh, time or genre or media in terms of the kind of art that I'm willing to help um, people learn about and acquire and collect. Um, and so uh, I'm offering the full suite of art advisory services um, uh, to folks. I kicked off the company earlier this year. I'm going to be traveling regularly to major art world centers um, such as um, New York, um, but I plan to be based in Miami, um, Florida, um, for the foreseeable future, um, which is also a great city um, to experience art in, especially in November and December when we have the art fairs going on. And I've been to those a number of times now and have gotten to know the Miami art world or the art scene well. Um, but I also you know, studied in New York City and I lived in Europe for many years. Um, and so I know how to look for art all over the place. I'm a, a unicorn uh, myself and um, I can't wait to like share more of my experiences with you. I don't know if there's going to be one quite as comparable to the one as I had that I had with Matthew Wong for quite some time because I think it's a, almost like a once in seven years experience that I had. But perhaps I'll su surprise myself, and I look forward to creating um, these um, these experiences together with you. So thank you very very much. Thank you. It was great. Yeah.